Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe. This is the Expat Money Show. And today's guest is the founder of DonorSea, a support network for the world's poorest. Their mission is to become the world's fastest growing charity platform in to usher in a new age for global charity, raising the industry standards for transparency, immediacy, and innovation. Please welcome to the show, Gret Klyer. Gret, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Mikkel. Very happy to have you here. You know, I've had someone else on recently where we've talked about nonprofits and charities, but your thing is actually quite different. So I actually felt like this is an appropriate thing and, and certainly your experience as an expat. So I'm, I'm excited to get into all of these types of things. But before we get going today, why don't you take a minute and kind of walk us through your backstory? Yeah, that's thanks for asking that, and I would love to start there. So I'll, I'll do, it'll be a super quick run through, and then we can dive into whatever section you want later on. Essentially, I graduated from college in 2012. I spent a year in the corporate world. While I was there, I kind of had this crisis of meaning where I was projecting out the next 20 years of my life, and I thought, you know, at this corporate job, I feel very replaceable. I feel like I could just leave some afternoon. They'll just replace me with some other cog in the machine. And that caused me to despair and wonder like, what's the purpose of all this? And so I just wanted to blow up my life and reset it. And I had the opportunity to move to Malawi, Africa, fell into my lap. While I was in Malawi, um, I, at first I went over to be a teacher. So I was a, a pre-calculus and an algebra two two teacher uh, those those that first year and a half. I lived there for three years total. And I transitioned from being a teacher at an international school to doing just straight up poverty alleviation work. I started doing these small crowdfunding campaigns. They grew and grew and grew. Um, and eventually I, my third year in Malawi, I launched or I crowdfunded $100,000 to build a girls school, uh, Malawi's uh, Education rate for girls in high school is about 12%, so extremely low, um, very large gender disparity gap in Malawi. And um, after that school launched, I handed it over to local Malawian nationals, so they're completely running it, it's fully sustainable. And then um, from there, that generated some attention and I uh, started a platform called DonorSea. Um, and you mentioned what DonorSea is, it's a way for donors to see where their money goes when they donate. So if you donate to a little girl who needs hearing aids, you'll get a video of her hearing for the first time. And um, the one thing I skipped, which I think is kind of important to mention, is kind of like the the transformation I went through where I, uh, like the first month I was in Malawi, um, I used to, I was, I was a teacher there, but I used to go out to this local village. And um, while I was out in this local village, I, um, there was this young girl, Emily, she's like five years old, or she was seven years old at the time. And when I, um, someone kind of told me her backstory and essentially her mother had passed away because she couldn't afford a $20 trip to the hospital. That was shocking to me. And um, so her dad ran away, her mom passed away from just like a $20, uh, not having $20. And um, that kind of, that's what unfolded into me getting more involved and passionate about poverty. That's what gave me meaning in my life. And that's what eventually led me to start Donor C. So anyways, that's the quick rundown of, of my backstory. Okay, so let's uh, let's take these things in section because there is a <laughs> lot good. to unpack there. Yeah. All right, so the opportunity to go to Malawi landed in your lap. Like, how? I mean, I've traveled yeah. extensively in Africa. I've never had an opportunity like that. Like, that's pretty off the beaten path, I would say. Yeah, so I was working at this corporate job and I spent six months looking for an opportunity to go overseas. I just, I really thought like, I don't know exactly what I should do with my life. I just know I'm not on the right path right now. I want to blow it up. I want to reset it because I'm, it's just too depressing to think about like me doing the same thing at a higher scale 20 years down the road. So um, I started applying to different organizations to, like I applied to the World Race, which is like a short-term mission thing where you do 11 countries in 11 months. I applied to different places. A lot of them accepted me and but none of them really felt like, okay, this is exactly what I want to do. I'm not sure this is exactly how I want to spend my time overseas. And so a lot of it didn't work out. I was at a wedding. I was a groomsman and one of the other groomsmen, I was having a conversation with him. Um, I had never met him before and his name was Woody. And he says, um, I told him like, yeah, I'm, I'm just working this corporate job. And he's like, and what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm going to go teach, uh, I'm going to go teach history in Malawi. 
And I said, oh, that's so interesting. And he said, well, I'm kind of scared about it. You know, I was just trying to get a history job in the States. I couldn't find one. So I got a history job. The only place that would take me in Malawi. And um, I'm just nervous about the whole thing because, you know, I never really intended to go overseas. And he said, and then I said, well, don't be nervous, man. You're going to be teaching kids in Africa and for the next year of your life. And I'm going to be working this depressing corporate job. Like I, you know, you're, you're lucky. And he said, um, I think they have another spot open if you're interested in going overseas. And then I said, I can't, I'm not a teacher. Um, like, you know, hypothetically I could maybe teach math. Um, but like, that's, you know, I, it's just really not something I, I've ever thought about doing before. And then he said, yeah, I think it's a math position that they have left open to fill. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So was he, was it actually, or was it like, he Truly, was just yeah. kind of like pushing forwards, like no, giving he you the answers was... you needed? <laughs> <laughs> no, he thought I was, you know, he, people all the time kind of say, yeah, I'd like to be, I'd like to go overseas sometime, or I'd like to go do, you know, go do that extreme thing. People are always saying that. So he was of the, he was of the mind that this guy's not serious. He doesn't, doesn't actually, there's no chance that he actually goes overseas. He was just kind of filling me in on what was like, actually the reality. They actually needed an algebra two and three calculus teacher in the next year. Um, and so, and he, and I was like, well, send me some information. And he said, uh, He's like, all right, I will. I definitely will. And a few days go by and he doesn't send it to me. So I have to like text him and say like, hey, please send me the information. And so he sends it, but he thinks again, I'm just joking. And then, um, so that conversation happened on July 13th, uh, 2013. And then August 13th, so 30 days later, um, I was on a plane to Malawi. I quit my job, got my shots. I just, I, I had just decided, I mean, it was the opportunity I was looking for. And it felt, so it, it did fall into my lap. I was looking, but this, I mean, it did just kind of fall in there. Wow. That's mad. So what did your family, what did your friends, what did the people around you, your community think when you kind of told them like, all right, in 30 days or whatever it was when you actually made the decision and we're jumping on the plane, like that little interim period, what did they have yeah. to say about this? I think that they were mostly excited for me. It's hard to tell. I remember my mom dropped me off at the airport. And, um, she, you know, she had just like kept it together the entire time. And she, you know, like, I'm excited for you. My mom, uh, she's an immigrant from Ecuador. So I'm half Ecuadorian. So she has that like travel bug. She's like always traveling around the world. So she was like, Oh, Gret's just kind of like following in my footsteps. And then she drops me off at the airport and just collapses into tears. <laughs> it's like oh. so scared. It's so like, give her a hug. And I like fly off to this other continent having just seen my mom. And, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I get where she's coming from. I, I didn't, um, I thought it was kind of appropriate. You know, it's like, it'd be tough to send your kid overseas and stuff or to watch your kid go overseas. Um, so yeah. So how I old think were you were, at this point? I was 23. 23. Okay, cool. So not a yeah. baby, but not far off. Not a baby, like but yeah, I still think that there's this, um, you know, I was still living nearby to my parents. I did have my own job and stuff, but um, yeah, you just, yeah. And my mom, you know, she's the, she's a Hispanic, Hispanic, passionate woman. Um, mm -hmm. So those emotions kind of flow freely from her. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. So you, I'm going to kind of do this play by play because I think that this is the best way to do it. So you arrive in Africa, first time in Africa, I'm guessing. No, I had been uh, for with my family on like a safari in ninth okay. grade. We went to Kenya um, for two weeks and we just we saw animals. Yep, exactly. Exactly that. And um, we and, and that was actually my first exposure to poverty when I when I traveled from where I when I when I traveled from the airport in Nairobi to the place that we stayed, it was like the poverty along the side of the streets was shocking to me as a ninth grade kid. Um, but then we just stayed at these like nice resorts the whole time. And, um, and so, you know, and then I was in ninth grade. So I went back to the States and played Chipotle and or, sorry, sorry, ate Chipotle, played Halo, all that stuff. <laughs> um, so anyways, yeah, I, that, it was my second time in Africa. Okay. Well, yeah. And Kenya by a lot of standards is a lot more developed than some of the other countries. Definitely. I mean, definitely. I've been to Nigeria multiple times. I've been to Uganda and Botswana, Zimbabwe and, and Kenya. Yeah. So yeah, That's... and this was the 90s. Um, so like Nairobi has really come a long way, mm -hmm. even just in the last like 20 years. Um, and it still was very developed at that time. Um, but in the last 20 years, there's been just insane development in like Nairobi and some of the other larger cities. So yeah, it's it's crazy. So what was Malawi like 
is as a country? What were the people like? What was the response from the people when you arrived? I'm super curious about all these cultural things here. Yeah, so Malawi has a nickname called the Warm Heart of Africa, and the people there, and it really describes the people there very well. They're extremely kind. They're extremely generous people. Um, the year I moved there, Malawi was ranked as the poorest country in the world. It's usually in the bottom five. The year I moved there, there was a big kind of uh, cor corruption scandal with the government that just tanked the, co the country's um, GDP. And so it was ranked as the poorest country in the world at the year I moved there. So, so very impoverished. Um, it's about 17 million people, 2 million people, 2 to 3 million people like live in the cities. Um, so I lived in the city and there's like two main cities in Malawi. And then almost everyone else, um, like another 12 to 15 million people they're all living out in the in these like rural villages and so that's that's like the 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 most common kind of mode of living in in malawi and yeah the people but no matter where you go the people were incredibly kind incredibly generous and you know all those stories that you hear where like i'm i'm the guy where the the gdp in america is something like 150 times per capita what the GDP is in Malawi, but like I would go to someone's house in Malawi and they would just shower me with generosity and food and whatever it is, even though that was a, a, a big, um, that was a big thing for them. It was, it was a lot of, for them to give of themselves in that way. Um, they were just incredibly generous people. And so, yeah, I, when I arrived there, um, at first I was living on this. So I lived on a compound, the same kind of compound as the school. So I wasn't living in like, kind of a village kind of hut setting. I had the, the compound I lived in was like pretty nice, pretty developed. And um, the school I taught at was um, kind of a combination. It was like 50% Malawian kids and 50% expats um, mm -hmm. like myself who were in some cases, they were like missionary kids or their, their parents worked at the U S embassy or one of the other embassies. And then the other, the other 50% were like upper-class Malawians. And so my students were kind of a really cool mix of both local Malawians and expat kids. Um, and so, yeah, and I think one of the stark, one of the things that was a really stark contrast between my life, my, my understanding of kind of the youth in America and the youth in Malawi that I was interacting with was the level of appreciation that they had for their, for education. I think that they understood and appreciated that education was something that you shouldn't take for granted because that like their drive to the school every day they're just passing pretty intense poverty and when you know when you're in america and you're driving from the suburbs to your like really nice school you just don't have that same like it, it's just not in your face in the same way and so you you can, you, you can lose some of that appreciation so they were like very very grateful to be educated um, which was kind of surprising for me because i'm just expecting to go teach like some kids who are like what kid likes school, you know, that's not something that you actually, it's not common, but it was, that's kind of the, the nature of how it was there. So. Yeah. I think that this is a, a challenging one for me to get my head around because I'm so anti-school. I mean, I homeschool my kids or world school. <laughs> oh, my okay, kids cool. Where, you know, I dropped out of school when I was 12 years old. I'm self-taught. I'm an autodidact. And, you know, we're actually me and my business partner are creating an online school right now for kids, mm. for high school kids, an online program. And it's all based on libertarian values and all these types of things. So for me, school is like, I think of the Canadian and the American model where it is government sponsored and it's, it's mm -hmm. a lot of additional propaganda and things like that. And sometimes I forget that that's not the way it is everywhere in the world. And actually for certain people, for certain countries and certain groups, school is a great answer. And I mean, I need to understand that more because I'm always looking at things through my lens. Now, my perspective, I, I think I am better than a lot of people with looking at things from alternative perspectives because I've been traveling for so long. But education is one of those topics, which is, uh, is still interesting, still really. Yeah, no, I, I can definitely appreciate that. I mean, homeschool is homeschool or private school. Definitely something that my wife and I have talked about. So we have uh, I know that you mentioned earlier that you have a couple kids. Mm -hmm. We have um, we have one right now, uh, 11 months old, a uh, little Galilee. And then we have a, a second one that's on the way due in January. Congratulations. So they're, they're very young, but we're you know, there's conversations about how exactly we want to raise them and what kind of school to send them to. So, um, yeah, I mean, the whole, the conversation is fascinating, but I think like 
you know, I guess my perspective is we get to have that conversation because we grew up in like a highly developed society um, where there's a certain, certain like just baseline that is provided to like clean water, electricity, access to internet, education. There's like, there's like a certain baseline that everyone gets at least like this minimum. And that baseline is not, at least in, in Malawi and several other places around the world, that baseline, it's like people are not even close to that. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think that's kind of the, um, th- there's just big differences depending on where you're born, essentially. So, um, but I definitely appreciate like the, the conversation around it. My wife and I are having some of the same conversations. So Brilliant. So with the online, or sorry, with the, the school that you were teaching at, what was the experience like? So you've never taught before, young man going to Africa, you show up and now you're thrown in front of, what, what ages were the kids when you first arrived? Well, they were high school ages. Um, okay. So they're, so I guess 14 to 18, roughly, or 13 to 17 for the, you know, at the beginning of the year. So how did you deal with it as like, as an expat, as going in there and as a new job in a profession, you don't know in a continent, you don't know very well. Like I'm yeah. kind of curious about these types of things. I was pretty nervous. Um, I think, cause I, uh, I never took pre-calculus in high school. I took statistics. Um, and I've always been like very like high aptitude for math. It's just like very easy for me to learn. So I taught myself, um, actually someone helped me kind of like tutor me or whatever, but, um, I taught myself pre-calculus the, the one or two weeks before I left for Malawi, like in that period of time where I quit my job and stuff. I, one of the thing of the things I did was I taught myself pre-calculus and, um, but I was kind of nervous about just, I had come from a very demanding job and I was going to this new job where I was, I felt very ill-equipped, um, and even on like the flight over, uh, we were, we stopped in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, mm-hmm. and um, me and the other guy I was traveling with, we missed the flight. So we had to spend 24 hours in the airport. It was just a miserable experience. So I just came there and I was so, um, like, I just felt off kilter. I felt ill-equipped to, to, to do the job I had to do. And then I think one of the things I realized when I got there was, one, the people there are very gracious. Two, the level of kind of professionalism and demand is not the same as in America. Um, Mm -hmm. It's just a lot more relaxed. And the, also just the, like one of the the common phrases that people talk about in the charity space is this concept of brain drain, where you have like a country like Malawi and the smartest, most intelligent people in Malawi, most of them don't want to stay there. They most, most of them want to go and, and like to another like place like the UK or America, someplace where they can, they can just get the benefits of the opportunity. So because of that, you just have this, um, this, this, these unfortunate situations where all the talent leaves the country and, you know, you're left in situations where um, the people, a lot of the people who who are left behind um, don't get to benefit from the talent that leaves Um, and other countries get to benefit as well. So there's a whole conversation around that. Um, But anyways, because of that, I was able to, I quickly learned that they were extremely appreciative that I was just there in the first place. Like they understood, okay, like um, Greg came from a different profession. He's not, uh, he hasn't taught this before, but for them, it was a big gift that I could be there and and, um, help teach them in that way. And so, yeah, I, I was nervous going into it. It didn't take long for me to feel like very welcome very welcomed and like, oh, I'm, I'm actually making a contribution here because it's just hard to get, it's hard to get um, someone who knows pre-calculus and algebra two to be a teacher out in this, out in this place and, and for the, you know, the rate that they're paying and all that stuff. So just, they were very appreciative. Amazing. Well, and that kind of leads into my next question and please forgive my ignorance on this one, but why can't a local person from Malawi do this type of work? Why do they have to bring in an expat, why do they need to bring in someone from the United States to do this? Well, it's a, it is a good question. And obviously that's the ideal. Um, you don't want to be taking jobs away from anyone else. And that's something, you know, that's something that we talk about all the time with my organization, Donorcy. Um, like, I think that there is value to these like short-term mission trips that people go on. There is value there, but the value is not in like this house that you build or the orphanage that you paint because there's people there who can do all those skills. Um, in, in the situation I was in, um, I'll put it this way. When so I, I actually taught the high school there, and then I which was which was had the expat kids and some of the upper class Malawians. I also taught um, the the local college, 
And at the local college, the math level there was, I was teaching freshman math and I was essentially teaching like the, the most complex that we got for the freshman class was long, was long division. Um, and so they're, you know, they're actually at a lower level than the, than the high school kids, just kind of like a different echelon. So I think, um, and, and this goes to the point we were talking about earlier, um, unfortunately, a lot of the, like the government provided schools are not up to this like very basic level of education, 12%, only 12% of the girls in the country are being educated in the first place. And then the education, like only 12% are graduating from high school. And then of the 12% that actually do graduate, they're not getting the same level of training that you would get like here in the, in the States. Um, so the capacity to have like a pre-calculus and algebra two, algebra two teacher, it's a little bit more advanced than, than would be normally available. And they do, they did hire several um, Malawians. They hired for, for all sorts of different positions. Like a lot of my coworkers were Malawian teachers, um, but it was a combination of um, both my efforts and, and but, you know, both expat efforts and local Malawian efforts. So it's a really good thing. Um, so anyways, it, it's complex, but the, um, the main, the main thing is there's there's just not that like base level mm -hmm. that that you have here and here I, i'm saying i know you're not in the states but the, this base level that you have in the states or in other developed countries that base level just doesn't exist in other places and so bringing people in who can help it's like kind of the same thing with um with some of the medical stuff like as much as possible you want malawian doctors to be taking care of malawian patients etc as much as as much as possible but for example um I remember there was this one girl who needed a cochlear implant so she could hear for the first time. They don't have a surgeon in the entire country who can do a cochlear implant surgery. That doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So they had to fly in someone from the UK. It cost $50,000, which again, is just like an unfathomable amount to them. Um, but it gave a girl hearing. And so, um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's essentially the, the dynamics is, is they're just missing a lot of the talent that, that we're like, we're accustomed to because we're living in the developed world, but they're, but for that, for that, in that situation, it's rare. So is that kind of a continuation on the brain drain when they do have educated people, the educated people are leaving? Because I know I have a lot of friends from South Africa. I, I normally live in Panama. At the moment, I'm in Brazil, but normally I, I live in Panama. And I have tons of South African friends there. And they were telling me lots of stories how you might have doctors and people there right now who have the education, but all of their kids, they're sending them to the U.S., to Canada, to yeah. England, to all these other countries for their education. And then the kids, they don't want to come home. They actually immigrate there and they build the rest of their life. So kind of year by year, things are actually getting worse. They're not getting better because there's such a all the talent pool is moving overseas. So is that kind of the same situation that you have, or do you think that the talent just wasn't there in the first place? Like, I'd, I want to yeah, understand no, I mean, this I bit definitely, more. Yeah, I think um, it's a it's a really good question. It's a tough one to tackle just because uh, um, of the way, you know, people get offended so easily. But I think, um, so let me just say one thing. South Africa is, is like a whole echelon higher than even Malawi. And then... Um, and then, you know, the UK and the US in terms of their um, like talent pool and so forth would be, you know, even higher above that. It's, I mean, in the US would probably definitely be the highest with their, with like Silicon Valley and so forth. So, um, so South Africa is, is, uh, is just in a much better position than, than Malawi is in, in many ways. But um, yeah, so essentially it's the whole discussion can kind of come around this, this idea of like the poverty cycle. Um, so there are certain things that keep people keep thing that make it very hard for for societies or individuals to lift them to, to be lifted out of poverty, um, and there are all sorts of forces that cause that. One of them is brain drain, um, but like another one that is pretty common would be. Um, so here's like a, an interesting dynamic that was that's pretty co pretty common in agrarian societies. Um, when, when you live when you when you are living in a village and you have a ton of, like all of your neighbors are also living in a village and your all of your income is based off of the crops that you grow and stuff. You might have some people that have a good crop season, some people that have a bad crop season, but these are your neighbors and you live with them on a on a yearly basis. So if your neighbor has a bad crop season, you're inclined to help them out and give your extra to them and vice versa. Um, what that does is it, so it, it kind of dilutes the concept of personal property rights. So there, be, there becomes this expectation, anyone who has excess should give their excess to other people. And within a, when you have a small community, that 
ends up working out pretty well. But what it does is it often prevents development. Like people aren't able to save, they're not able to lift themselves out of their situation because excess is how you lift yourself out of a situation. Excess is how you like buy a nicer tool and like have higher crop yields and so forth. But in this case, when you have someone who like, when you have a neighbor who, if you don't share with them, they will die or they will have a terrible, terrible season in life. Um, it just becomes hard to, to do that. So there's a lot of these dynamics that kind of like compound on each other to, to really make it very difficult. The other one, and Harvard Business Review has done some really good studies on this because I, you know, I never want to make it seem like, um, I never want to make it seem like people who are in poverty are there, you know, are, are there because they're worse, they're worse than people who are not in poverty. Like there are certain effects of poverty that are, are, universally hard no matter who you are and that's why poverty alleviation is such a a um challenge it can be a challenging field because um uh because the effects of like these poverty cycles are so strong so anyways one of the things that happens is um is is people just get really i'll just i'll leave it at that i said people get really really stuck in these poverty cycles and um, and, and unfortunately, you need some. Sometimes you need some outside forces or some extra hand ups because uh, there's this kind of like short term mindset that gets built in when you are penny pinching. So, mm -hmm. well, I think that this is really interesting stuff because I have to be very honest. These are not things that I know and understand so much about, and that's why I want to have you on the show because I want to learn and and I want my listeners to learn as well. And. I don't have all the answers. I'm not asking questions here that I know the answer to. This is not scripted. I, I think I told you at the beginning of the episode, I literally have no questions drafted. This is just a conversation where I want to explore some things so I have a better understanding, which is hopefully going to make me a better person so that I can go forward and inspire more people, if that kind of makes sense. You know, I'm That's always trying, trying to do more and do better and understand better. I'm put myself in difficult situations and situations that I don't understand. And I have not, not been in your situation. Yes, I've traveled. I've traveled extensively. I've traveled probably more than anyone you'll ever meet in your life. But the type of work that you've done, I've not done. So I don't know what these things are like. Yeah. So, well, first of all, I really appreciate your candor there. It, it, it's um, It's really refreshing and something that yeah, I, something that's just good to see, you know, I, that's kind of a big part of our mission at Donorcy is like, we, we really do care about poverty alleviation, but we believe part of, especially for the, for the global poor. Um, but one of the things that we, one of the ways that we think poverty alleviation gets better is through more awareness. I think a lot of people are just unaware of the, ex the, the extent of poverty in the world. Um, so I think this, the statistic that always just kind of explodes people's minds that I share is if you make, if your income is $3 a day or less, um, that means you live in the poorest half of the world. So you would think it's only like the bottom, you know, 5% who are living on $3 a day or less. It's actually half the planet. So um, there's this kind of like Pareto principle where the top, you know, the top 1% are like really, really rich. The top 10% are pretty rich. And then there's a steep decline after that. So that the bottom 50% end up being kind of the, um, where the bottom 50% end up, end up being kind of uniformly poor alongside each other. So there's, there's some people who are living on, you know, like 20 or 30 cents a day, but just if you're in the bottom, if you're in the bottom 50%, you're, you're living on less than $3 a day. Okay. So, all right. So one last question about your experience as a teacher, and then I want to move into some of your work. And this might even be a good segue. Now, the work that you did when you came over to Malawi, was that a job or was that charity work or peace work or missionary work? Like, what was that? Yeah, I would describe it as a kind of a hybrid between charity work and um, and a job because I was I was paid that first year I was there. Um, but at the same time, it, you know, it, it did not, I was living off of $600 a month and I obviously could have made more money <laughs> doing many other things. Um, and it, it didn't exactly like it, it didn't exactly open up, you know, more career opportunities to move to the other side of the planet and do something completely outside of my industry. Um, so in that way it was charity work and it, and it was, a. uh, a huge benefit to the people there like just it's hard to convey but like you really do 
just by like being there um, and having and giving jobs to the local people there. Like I had, I tell people this all the time and it kind of surprises them. I had a cook. um, I had people, I had a gardener. I had these different people who were employed um, just to take care of, you know, things around the house I was living in. And those, those jobs that you provide for people, those people are very appreciative of them. And there's huge lines of people who'd be lining up behind them to take that job if it, if they could. Um, So just some of those dynamics are, are important to keep in mind. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a, so I, I kind of saw, saw it as this, as this combination, but um, it was also hugely beneficial to me. Like I, it taught me a lot and it was extremely gratifying and it was, a, it was a heck of a lot easier than the corporate job I had. It was a lot more meaningful, a lot more purposeful. So yeah, it, it didn't pay very well, but um, it was very, very rewarding. Well, that makes sense. Um, from my side, like like what you just said just really resonated with me about hiring the local people and giving a job. I've been traveling for 21 years straight. I have not stopped in 21 years of traveling around the world. I've been around the planet more than 400 times, and I mostly go to developing countries. That's what I think is most interesting, and that's where I spend the most of my time is in developing countries, especially if I'm going away on holiday or something like that. I like to do things that are very different than a lot of other people. I'm spending my money with the locals. I'm not usually staying at the big branded hotels, uh, you know, US chains and things like that. I'm going to local restaurants. I'm my dollars are coming in and they're they're not created from inside the country. It's completely, you know, how to say this? There, it's capital that's flowing into the country and I'm using it and I'm spending it on entrepreneurs and people who are responsible for themselves. So I don't have a lot of experience with charity at all, but I do have experience with driving an economy on goods and services in a marketplace in a freely voluntary manner. I value the services more than I value the dollars and therefore I exchange and I see that this helps. So that's kind of part of my question, I mean, or part of the sticking point, I guess, I have with charities is I never want to give money with, maybe this sounds awful, but without something in return. Go ahead and say it. I I love this topic, so please just say it, you know? All right. I don't want to give something without something in return. And it's not that I actually need to get something physical. And it's not something that like, oh, I'm so greedy and I need to make sure it's all about me. I actually don't want to be in a situation where I'm giving people money and then they're like, oh, if I sit home and do nothing, or if I send my kid out on the street with a sign to beg for money, then the child doesn't need to go to school or I don't need to get a work or a job and I don't need to provide value because by keeping myself poor or looking poor, I am going to get more money. Does that make sense? Like that's yeah. this weird dynamic I have in my it's head that I'm still weird. trying to hear, get through. I hear exactly what you're saying. What I hear you saying is that you're not against being generous. You don't want to be greedy. You just want, if you're going to help people, you want it to be effective. You want it to actually work. And the way like your experience has been um, that a lot of the times when people just kind of give handouts to other people, it's ineffective. It creates other problems. There's entire volumes and libraries of books written about all of the problems that have been created by just giving handouts to people. So that's what I'm hearing you say. It's like, I just want to- And and that, and I am very, very acutely aware of people's motivation. Mm -hmm. I think that as an entrepreneur, I'm constantly trying to find ways that I provide value to other people. And that's my motivation. And so that's what I want to support in other people is this type of mindset. If someone thinks, okay, what can I do for someone else? to help them. Yeah. How can I be rewarded? How can I be paid? How can I be compensated for that? Yeah. And if I motivate people to sit home, then that's terrible. But once again, my point is, I don't know as much about you in <laughs> your situation yeah. and what you've seen. So, well, first, yeah. let me just, I think this is, a, let me, I do want to talk about the, the idea of like sustainability and giving effectively and all that stuff. So, but let's just table that for a second. I have an anecdote I thought I'd share about this like mindset idea. So there was this, um, there was this single mother of two kids and my first year in Malawi, her name was Rose and she cleaned the classrooms um, at the school I worked at. And so um, she was actually like the first kind of small 
crowdfunding project I ever did. It was $60 to get her a bike so she could drive, so she could um, go to school both ways. And so um, anyways, after talking to Rose, uh, you know, I kind of became friends with her and um, she wanted to go back to school. And so, um, you know, I think we did something to support her with that. And she would ask me, she was taking a math class. And so she'd ask me for help with math. And um, again, like the, the educational infrastructure in Malawi, not great, but especially when it comes to teaching math, it's, it's about as, that's probably the lowest subject um, in terms of like test scores and so forth in the whole country is math. It's just, um, Unfortunately, unfortunately, the test scores for math are not high in Malawi. So very difficult to kind of like catch up and do well in math. So she was asking me for, for tutoring. And so she would do a problem. She would try and do a problem and I would look at it and she would not do well. And she kept saying, I kept hearing her say over and over again, I'm not good at math. Malawians aren't good at math. I, Malawians just can't do math. Like she kept saying that, like repeating this over and over, over and over again. It was this internalized mindset that she had. And I was trying to teach her the math, but every time she would mess up, she would, it would just reinforce this mindset that she had. And so instead of, so I took a break and I said, instead of trying to teach her math, I'm going to address what I think is actually the root cause, which is the, the mindset issue. And I said, Rose, if you don't mind, I'd like it if you stop saying that you're bad at math and that Malawians are bad at math. I'd like if, if you started saying things like, I'm good at math and I'm capable of doing this math equation well. And, um, and she did. And uh, soon after that, she was able to do the same exact math equations that she was struggling with moments before. And she and I said, all right, now do you see now say Malawians are good at math. I'm good at math. And she got and you could see like her face light up and her posture change. And she saw, she was able to recognize like she could choose the mindset she had about the, this particular math equation. And she didn't have to identify with this. Um, with this like older personality of not being good at math. And that was a very important thing. And she ended up graduating um, and is in a better place now because of that and able to take care of her kids a little bit better. And um, so that, anyways, that was like a small example of like this important, like there, there's a lot of things that you can change on like a material level, but that, that mindset shift is a really important part of the, of someone kind of getting out of a, of a, of a mindset that's, that's not, conducive to them being lifted out of poverty. Okay, so there's that anecdote. Um, okay, so there's this conversation around um, the, the, the common way that you, the, you described it really well. Um, there's a lot of situations where you just give money to people and I, even the, I, I could, I, there's, a, I could, there's probably thousands of, of people in Malawi who hold signs and they beg and people give them money and they're essentially employing that person to beg. And, um, and you know, there's and there's kids who are who are street beggars, and they should be in school, but they've there's this whole economy around begging that's developed, and so the, instead of going to school, the kids just become street beggars, and you know, you're trying to do a good thing by helping the kid out and giving them food, but you're also incentivizing them to continue to beg um, and not go back to school. So um, these are like really important things to understand. It's like really totally appropriate, totally fine that um, that. People have concerns about this because those concerns are a hundred, are a thousand percent valid. Um, what we do um, at Donorcy is we we differentiate between two different types of poverty relief work. So there's development work, and then there is relief work. And relief work would be mostly like emergency situations or extremely vulnerable people. So sometimes, like this happened when I was in Malawi. At one time when I was in Malawi, there was a huge hurricane. There was massive flooding in Southern Malawi and 250,000 people had their houses gone, washed away in a flood. Entire villages were under underwater just as, terrible a situation as you could possibly have. Many people died. So what we did was we, we packed this giant semi-truck trailer with food and supplies and we brought it down to the people there and we just gave them food. We didn't make them do a job or like listen to a gospel message or any of that other stuff. We just gave them food because they're in an emergency situation. And there's there are certain situations where you just need to take care of people because they have been because something really, really unfair happened to them. And, and it's good to just take care of those people. Um, on the more micro level, there are situations like, um, you know, I, I often put orphans and widows in a different category. They're just unfairly disadvantaged. And I think especially, you know, in, 
in a more developed society, um, sometimes you can have a widow who can like take care of themselves and so forth. But in a, in a developing society um, where, you know, there's still kind of pretty strong gender roles and so forth, um, a lot of time, times the, the women are not educated, they have lots of kids, not even literate, and then their husband dies. And that's, it's not a death sentence, but it's pretty close. You know, it's just, that's an extremely, extremely tough situation. So orphans and widows, we put them in like a, a little bit of a separate, in, in a separate category, um, because they're, they've had something really, really tragic to happen to them. They're not an able-bodied man who can go out and get a job and start a business and all this other stuff. They're in a special category. So I would say in those situations, you want to do what you can to take care of themselves, to take care of those people. Um, and I think you're always going to have people like that. Like the world is just not ever going to be free of, of people who, who have just the, the, these, whole, these horrible um, extra vulnerabilities that are just part of life. And, and we, I think you should like have a portion of whatever you, of whatever society has to give should take care of those people in some way, one form or another. Um, but then, so that's relief work. They're just like super unfair situations that your compassion should move you to, to, to do something in that situation. Um, but again, rare, you only want to do it in very specific circumstances. And if you do it out, if you try and do relief work for someone who could just go get a job, you're incentivizing the wrong things. If you're trying to do relief work and it's keeping a kid from going back to school, that could be um, the wrong thing. Okay, so then there's development development work. And that is, uh, that, that's a big, that's not the same thing as relief work. So development work is where you essentially partner alongside with people and you both mutually have the goal to have that person be lifted out of poverty in a sustainable way where, where it's, an, it's a one-time transformational thing that just carries them forward. So an example like that would be helping them start a business. Like a lot of people need help for like that. There's that verse in Matthew that even I was listening to a podcast from um, some, some Silicon Valley you know, startup investors this morning. Um, and even this, these Silicon Valley guys are talking about this verse in Matthew that, that says to whom much is given, much will, to whom much is given, they'll be given even more. And to those who don't have um, hardly anything, like even more will be taken away from them. It's just, a, it's a reality of life. It's that Pareto principle we talked about earlier. And so people in that, um, so people who you want them to be lifted out of poverty, though they do need kind of like this injection at the very beginning, but you have to do it in a way that's smart and intelligent and actually leads to lasting change. So I have a really good example, a really good anecdote. Um, one of our partners on DonorSea, her name is Amy Hathaway. And um, she has, she does kind of like a two part um, relief and development. She has a two part relief and development system. So first there are babies in Tanzania, she, she works in Tanzania. There are babies in Tanzania who are on the brink of starvation and they need formula milk. Their mom uh, maybe didn't make it through childbirth or maybe the mom had triplets and doesn't have the milk to produce for the three kids. And you think, well, there's other women in the village who could just be a wet nurse, but there's like HIV issues. So you can't like, it's, it's more complicated than people think. So sometimes you just need to give this, you need to make sure the baby doesn't die and you just need to give them formula milk. And so you can do that on donor C it's like 250 bucks and you can watch the baby go from like emaciated. You can see their ribs to three months later, six months later, you see the baby happy, healthy, plump, fat, just good looking baby, you know? <laughs> um, and you want every baby to look like that. And so 250 bucks, you get to like provide six months of formula milk for these babies. And that's a good thing to do. Like you can do that a, a, a thousand times out of a thousand and, and there's still be plenty of need left over as long as you're not, as long as you're not, you know, um, doing it for mothers who are in a situation where they could provide for it themselves. Um, so that's, that's the relief. But then what happens? Okay, so then you have a six month old baby and what do you do with that baby? The, they've been, they've had their formula milk provided for the last six months, but now what, what's, how, how is that baby going to be taken care of for taking care of the rest of their life? So this is the, the genius behind what Amy Hathaway does um, in her organization that we partner with. After the baby it has their formula milk, she then finds a caretaker of the baby, usually an aunt or a grandmother, because a lot of times the mothers didn't make it through childbirth. Sometimes it's the mother. And, um, and they set the ba they set the baby's caretaker up with um, a business. So, and it, this is, these are small businesses, um, usually shops like, like being a tailor, um, they'll, they'll get the, the, the mother a sewing machine 
or they will set them up with a fruit stand or some other business like that. And I, those businesses are usually like $450 to start. And they have an 80% Amy, Amy Hathaway and her organization, they have an 80% success rate. So for every five times that you start this business, four of them are successful. The mom continues. She has an income on herself for, of her own. She's empowered. She's dignified. And she's able to provide a future for this baby that was on the brink of starvation just six months earlier. So that's that two-part kind of like relief and development thing. We're huge believers in effective charity. We just want things to work. We want people to be actually lifted out of poverty. We don't want to incentivize anything bad. And we're not perfect. We're going to make a lot of mistakes. Everyone's going to make lots of mistakes. We're living in very, the, 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 the countries that we operate in have all sorts of issues and problems and they're, it's difficult to operate in them many times and you're going to have stuff like that happen. But hard to argue with an 80% success rate, hard to argue with feeding starving babies. I mean, we just, those are the types of stories that we really focus on. There's a lot of stuff that's like, okay, complicated, controversial, not sure if we should get involved with that. That's not the stuff that we focus on. There's plenty of opportunity to just help people who need help in effective ways. And those are the opportunities that we like, we narrow in on. And that's what we really like to do. I can honestly say I've never had anyone explain it to me like that. So thank you. Because I often, well, up until a minute ago, just kind of thought of them as the same thing, to be perfectly yeah. honest. You know, I just kind of thought of it all at as one type of thing. But clearly, actually, the way you describe it, it is not one thing. It is two things and two different pathways. And one can lead to the other. And yeah, okay. I don't really yeah, have like a follow-up question. To this. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just kind of like a statement, like, wow, all right. Yeah, that, so that's, that's kind of, I, I think that there's multiple things that are going on here. I think um, like yourself, you've, you've traveled to the developing world. So you have like this, you have like one foot in, the sorry the developed the, the developing world so you have like one foot in there you have some kind of framework a lot of the people you know i live in right now i live in northern virginia i'm 20 minutes 20 minutes outside of washington dc i grew up around this area as well i had you know intellectually that there are people living in poverty you know somewhere else in the world on an intellectual level you know that just like intellectually you know that there's this thing such as like quantum physics but you don't really understand like exactly what that means. And so for me, like I had to go to the other end of the world to like really understand that. Um, and like part of our job at DonorC, like if you go to DonorC.com and you look at all of the different projects, part of our job, we see it to educate on these concepts. Um, and we want people to, to feel it emotionally. Like it's not enough that you know that it exists. You have, you have to understand that they're, th these are human beings and they're living their lives right now while you and I are having this podcast or while your listeners are doing their workout or driving in the car, whatever it is that they're doing while your listeners are doing their thing. Like there's also these people living in poverty and they really do exist right now. I mean, they, they're, they're in very difficult situations and, um, and it's, it's hard to appreciate that unless you've, you either have been to the other side of the world or you just spend some time on donorsy.com. Um, so yeah, I mean, these are, these are uh, big issues that we're trying to tackle. Yeah, it's difficult for me because I have seen these things so often. It it's difficult for me that people don't know and understand about that other people don't understand what the rest of the world is like. I mean, that for me is normal is to see things like this and to deal with these types of situations and I mean, I've seen some of the most gut-wrenching things in my life. Like I lived in Guatemala for half a year and mm. seeing kids living in trash dumps and stuff and yeah. it's like it's, it's just brutal. Like I just, uh, it's still surprising to me that people don't understand what happens in the world. But I want to talk a little bit about how you came to this realization or why you decided after your time as a teacher that you really wanted to dedicate your life to this and build Donor C. And like, what was that transformation and how did that happen? Yeah, that's a good question. And yeah, even you talking about the kids, um, in trash dumps is like tough to think about. I mean, those kids are like, you know, a lot of them are still there. Um, and it's just, yeah, these are tough, uh, these are tough realities and they're kind of hidden. Um, they're, they're kind of hidden from a lot of people's kind of mainstream conversation. So the way that I had that realization, you know, the first time I, I saw, I saw something that just kind of settled in like really deeply in my soul and just stuck with me. I referenced it earlier is that that girl, Emily. So um, 
I was a teacher my first year in Malawi and um, every Friday afternoon I would go I'd drive out with a bunch of other people um, you know some teachers and some other Malawians and we'd go to this local village and we would just hang out in this local village so some of the people in this village were living on like 20 or 30 cents a day some people were living on two or three dollars a day but it was a very kind of impoverished village agrarian society and I just go play soccer with the kids. I would go hang out with um, just the locals there. And they're very friendly. They love having us around. And the kids, you know, so excited to see. They would see someone and they would just like point at you and they would say, Zungu, Zungu, which means white person. Um, and so they just, they just, they're, they just light up. Um, so as I was playing soccer with, uh, with all the people there, um, there's this girl on the sidelines, Emily, five or seven years old, always wore this purple dress. And I learned Emily's story. So um, two years before I met Emily, she, um, she, she still had both of her parents and her dad was very abusive and her dad abused her mom, Kalinde. Her mom's name is Kalinde. So her dad abused her mom um, pretty badly. And one time he just abused her enough that she really needed to go to the hospital. So um, the the guy who ran this like Friday village program, his name was Blessings. Um, he said to Kalinde, we need to get you to the hospital. It's $20. Like this is, you know, this is what you need. And Kalinde doesn't have $20. She's living on 20 or 30 cents a day. And when you live on 20 or 30 cents a day, you know, all your money is going to just like the basic necessities um, and like begging and with, from your neighbors and stuff like that. So Kalinde, um, so Blessings said, all right, that's fine. I have a friend in the States. And I'll ask him for $20. I know it's a lot, but I'll ask him for $20 and he'll send us the money and then we can get you to the hospital. So he sends an email to this guy in the States and the guy in the States isn't quite sure if she's, you know, isn't quite sure like what's going on, if this is legit, he's got concerns about, you know, the concept of giving handouts and stuff like that. And he doesn't really see like with his own eyes, like what exactly is going on. So he just says, um, sorry, I, I don't think I should give out, give 20, I, sh I don't think I should send you $20. This same guy, six months later, he comes on a short-term mission trip with a whole, you know, a whole group of people. And they're going on a tour through this village and um, they happen to come across Kalinde who's like writhing in pain on the ground. She had just been there for, she just been like there for months. And, um, and he says, to blessings, um, like what's going on here? Why is this person in so much pain? And blessing says, well, remember uh, how I asked you for $20 so someone could go to the hospital? This is the person who didn't get that money. So um, obviously being face to face with it, that was like this realization, um, that was this realization. So everyone on the mission trip, got rid of all their plans and what they said was we're, what we're going to do is we're just going to our this mission trip is to take care of this woman so um they got her a bed and mattress they got her food they took her to the hospital took her back and forth and they um and they just showered her with all the things that she needed just made her really comfortable and um as and, and then you know they had to go it was a one or two week mission trip um so they did everything that they possibly could for Colleen Day. And then they got her a bunch of extra stuff. And then at the end of the mission trip, you know, they provide her with some extra stuff. They got on a plane and they went home and the, the timing um, was horrible because uh, within 24 hours after they left, she passed away and Emily's dad ran off. Um, and so there's this realization that, you know, Emily's an orphan because of a $20, a lack of $20, which is just, hard to believe that that exists in the 21st century, but that again, like I, like I said, it, it's happening. It's, it's real. It's happening. Um, we just, you know, it's hidden from us. So um, that was the first time I, so seeing this girl on the sideline, she has this big smile on her face. She's always cheering for the boys to play soccer. And she's just like having the time of her life on the sidelines of this soccer game. And just seeing, seeing this girl every single Friday and being, being reminded of her story, um, that was the first time I felt like, okay, I should do something about this, or I should like somehow be involved with this. Um, so I started doing the first, the, the kind of the, what I first started doing was these like small crowdfunding campaigns. Um, so, so we would build someone a house for, you know, about $800. That's how much it costs to build a house with a tin roof and cement floor in these villages. 
Um, so we built Emily a house, and um, so Emily and her grandmother live in that house to this day. It's like a pretty nice house for, for their village. Um, we, we, we built 150 of these houses. We did other crowdfunding campaigns. We started, you know, formula milk for babies. Um, we provide mosquito nets. Um, so this is another example of kind of like a relief versus a development situation. When, 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 uh, 70% of a village sleeps under a mosquito net at night, the malaria rate in that village goes down 90%. Um, so providing m mosquito nets for people is a really good way. You know, we don't have to, you and I don't have to worry about malaria, or maybe you do actually, <laughs> given where you live. I forgot about that. But like most Americans, most people in the developed world don't have to worry about malaria. Um, but in the developing world, it's, it's a pretty common problem, it takes a lot of lives, especially kills a lot of kids under the age of five. Um, and so, you know, provide helping people kind of cope with malaria is one of those things. So anyways, we, we did these crowdfunding campaigns. My third, uh, my, my last kind of eight months in Malawi, uh, I, I crowdfunded $100,000 to build a girls school. And, um, and then, and really what I did was I just, I partnered with the local people. They're the ones who ran the school. They made it fully sustainable. So like the tuition that they're getting from the school um is paying for the ongoing bills of the school so really just a one-time injection and now there's this amazing school facility in the middle of this village that is educating at this point over 300 girls a year and um, those girls are graduating high school they're going on to college it's, it's an amazing thing um so i so but that crowdfunding campaign where we where we raised hundred thousand dollars there were several thousand it was kind of like this grassroots groundswell of support several thousand donors got involved and um after i did that from i it was like there was like this donor base that had been built and like from that i took that and i started i launched donor c so um i mentioned earlier donor c is a place where you get to see where your money goes when you donate so the concept where i was you know i was out in malawi by myself making videos showing people the impact of their donation but i wanted this to be something that was happening all over the world not just in malawi but in thailand and south america you know ecuador where i'm from other parts of sub-saharan africa wherever it is even eastern europe wherever it is that um that people would benefit from this i wanted people to have like this place that they could go to and they could donate and they could see they could get involved like like right there like they're on the ground and they could they see exactly who they're benefiting from and they see the video update um that that is a result of their generosity um because like not everyone can go to the other end of the world like i i did you know i was in a very fortunate position i could spend three years overseas that that was fortunate for me a lot of people it's easier i'm sure your your show gets into this it's easier than a lot of people think but some people are elderly some people have student loans some people have um lots of kids or whatever their situation is it's just more difficult to like go and serve in this capacity but what we did what we've done at donor c is if you're in your living room right now or if you're working out at the gym or wherever it is that you are, you can just open your phone. You can go to donorc.com and you can help people right from the comfort of your living room. And you can like people just like Emily's mom who really need this financial support. They're people who are living in material poverty. And every time you donate, you'll get a video from the person that you helped thanking you personally for your donation. So it'll say like, thank you, Mikel. Like you are the one who, um, provided the me with this new business you provided my baby with formula milk thank you and they'll, they'll thank you personally um so yeah that's what we've built at donor c we're really passionate about it we think it's going to help a lot of people and we want lots of people to be involved and we have an awesome community we have people who are grandmothers grandfathers school kids parents just people all over the the spectrum of humanity who are getting involved to support um people through donor c so that's yeah that's what we do wow Powerful stuff. Powerful story. Powerful. Yeah. That's intense, my friend. Very intense. Yeah. Brett, well, thank amazing, you. We're very excited. Amazing conversation. Um, if my listeners want to get a hold of you, if they want to find out more about this work, where can we send them? Yeah, send them. So um, you can follow me on social media if you want. You should definitely follow Donor C. And then really the thing, so we, we set something up just for your listeners. So you can go to donorc.com slash expat. So D-O-N-O-R-S-E-E.com slash expat. And anyone who goes there, if you sign up, um, you, you can sign up to give a monthly amount. You, it starts at $10, goes as high as you want. 
And whatever level you sign up at, your, your monthly donation will go directly to people in need and you'll get video updates every single month. Um, and it'll just automatically go. So like eight months will go by and you'll be like, wow, I helped all these people. I even forgot about it. And I'm getting, I have all these video updates to show how my, how my money is helping people. And then anyone who goes to that expat link, um, they'll get a free donor seat t-shirt. So when they can wear it, they're premium shirts, high quality, and they can tell their friends all about um, all about donorcy and, and it's a way for us to kind of get the word out. And, uh, you know, if you like, if you like the mission that we're on, if you want to be a part of it, um, we're, we're trying to grow, we are growing, but we would love to have your listeners as part of it. And, um, so this would be, that'd be a great way for them to get involved at donorcy.com slash expat. Amazing. Gret, thank you very much for this conversation. I really appreciate it. And I've certainly learned a lot and I'm, a little bit torn up at the moment, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go check it out myself and learn more myself. So thank you once again, and I will talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you, Mikael.